what peace really means. Justice, peace, peace. liberation, love, peace. Established in 1959, PRIO takes pride in being one of the world's oldest institutions of peace research. More importantly, we also aim to be one of the best, to be asking the right questions, and we certainly engage in the international public debate. Ultimately, PRIO's research should contribute to a future where peace is the norm and violence is the exception. A man who won't die for something is not fit to live. But should a man or woman also be willing to kill for something? In short, can it ever be right to use violence? It is my task to ask that uncomfortable question. We are engaged in an ongoing struggle between the forces of light and the instruments of darkness. What is the role of nonviolence in the struggle for liberation. Is it possible? Is it possible for humankind to lay down the burden of war, the burden of conflict, and move toward a different way, a better way? I am a firm believer in human security, providing basic health care, basic education. I will say that I really do believe sustainable peace is possible. When we educate what sustainable peace is, each of us has the ability to work with others to bring about change. I think it can be done. And I'm doing what I can to help people understand that they can help create a world of sustainable peace. Security is the most fundamental public good that any government provides. Without security, you can't develop. There are brave, clever people struggling to achieve effective governance. Our job is supporting them as effectively as possible. I realized that the political leaders would only change once there was a critical mass of informed citizens. That critical mass is now being put in place. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the 2014 PRIO Annual Peace Address. Our guest of honor this year is uh, Sir Paul Collier. He will speak uh, to the topic, Civil Conflict, what are the current risks, and what are the current solutions, what are the realistic solutions. We are living in a time when that is uh, a very timely uh, topic, we are all preoccupied with the changes that we see in the Middle East, the changes that we see in Russia and Ukraine to the east of us, and also uh, the uh, simmering conflicts that we see brewing in part of uh, East Asia, to take some, but perhaps to take the ones that uh, are potentially about to change the world as we know it. My name is Christian berghardt Wiking. I'm uh, the director of PRIO. I also have the privilege of uh, leading you through this evening. With the annual peace address, PRIO offers itself a gift. We also offer our friends or supporters a gift. The idea is to be inviting one distinguished guest who can inspire us all, who can uh, contribute to renew the agenda that we are preoccupied with, the agenda or peace research, and to inform the public debate on peace and war. The objective simply is for us to be challenged. Are we asking the right questions? Are we pursuing them constructively? How can we further the real-world impact of our knowledge? Though Paul, of course, is in many ways a peace researcher himself, there are few people in the world that are better suited for the task 
opposing us with this challenge than him. He will uh, soon be speaking to us, but I also want to take note that we have with us uh, the Norwegian uh, former uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, Jonas Gahr Støre, currently the head of uh, the Norwegian Labour Party, who will uh, later be engaging with uh, uh, Paul Collier's presentation. I will soon be back to you, but before we get to the uh, intellectual meat, we will offer a little bit of uh, food for the soul. We have invited the uh, Stefan William Olsen trio to uh, share a couple of tunes with them, with us. And Stefan, please introduce what you are going to present us with. <laughs> Stage is yours. Thank you. As far as uh, academics go, Sir Paul Collier needs no further introduction. He uh, has been described by um, The Economist as uh, one of the world's most thoughtful economists. His book, books consistently illumin illuminate and provoke. 
Collier is known as a strong proponent of what has been called the opportunity theory of civil war, in contrast to theories emphasizing grievances and inequalities. He currently serves as a professor of economics and public policy at the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford, where he also serves as a co-director of the Center for the Study of African Economies, a fellow of St. Anthony's College, and furthermore, he's a professorial invite at PISA, at the Science Po in Paris. If that wasn't enough, he also is an advisor to the Strategy and Policy Department of the International Monetary Fund, an advisor to the Africa region for the World Bank. And importantly, in the context we're speaking here, from 1998 to 2003, he served as the director of the Development Research Department of the World Bank, where he pioneered the World Bank's research into the linkages between conflict and development. Collier's research covers the economic causes and consequences of civil war, the effects of aid, and the problems of democracy in low-income and natural resource-rich societies. His books, which consistently provoke, although Paul told me just before uh, we came in here that uh, he never intends to provoke. For some reasons, there are certain debates where provocation, provocation seems to be inevitable. His books include The Plundered Planet, How to Reconcile Prosperity with Nature, from 2013, Wars, Guns and Votes, Democracy in Dangerous Places, from 2009, and uh, The Bottom Billion, from uh, 2007 which parenthetically by the colleague minister of uh, our commentator tonight, Jonas Garstöde, the then Minister of Development, Erik Solheim, was ranked as his favorite book in the world. Whether it's Jonas's favorite book, we don't know yet, but maybe we'll hear more about that later. In 2008, Paul Collier was awarded the, the commander of the Order of the British Empire for his services to scholarship and development and he was subsequently knighted in 2014 for promoting research and policy change in Africa. I'm proud to say that Paul is also a long-standing friend of uh, PRIOS. He has been working closely with many of our researchers here. He has been working closely with Nils Petr Gledic, with Howard Heger, who even did a stunt with him at the World Bank uh, more than a decade ago, and with uh, Scott Gates, to mention a few. So it's good, Paul, to have you here for this occasion. We are looking very much forward to the thoughts that you have to share with us tonight. We are honored that you will be with us. We know you're just off the plane from South Africa, but you do look amazingly fresh, and uh, we are certain that you'll manage to inspire us. Please, the floor Thank is you yours. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's conventional to start as a speaker by saying how honored you are to do this, but actually this time it's genuine, right? Um, I have a huge respect for PRIO for a very good reason. Right? This is uh, a fabulous institution. Um, I built a research institute on Africa, not as old or as big as PRIO by any means, but over 25 years I've learned that it's a long, slow business building a research institution. Um, they're easy to destroy, um, but there's no substitute for gradually building them up. And so I just congratulate you on what you've achieved. And um, it's a very distinctive achievement because, you know, first and foremost, I associate PRIO uh, with data. Um, the, the notion that you build up quantitative information and you can then convert information into knowledge. And uh, uh, once you've converted information into knowledge, you can begin to uh, formulate coherent policies. And that, that's uh, most surely the right way to go about things. Um, during the half century you've been doing that, what we've experienced has been the great moderation. Um, uh, 
peace has gradually spread. And um, the, the, very broadly, the, the foundations of that spread of peace have been economic prosperity and democracy. And that's, all that's sort of reasonably well established, I think. Um, but um, it isn't happening now. Um, and so what I'm going to be arguing, and here I'm going to be absolutely out on a limb, um, and uh, for once I'm well aware that what I'm going to say is controversial, um, um, but um, I'm going to argue that um, we're actually experienced a point of structural break where that recipe of prosperity and democracy spreads peace is just proving no longer to be true. Um, if I'm right that we're basically at a structural break, then unfortunately data won't help us for a while. <laughs> uh, structural breaks are the point at which uh, data into knowledge breaks down. Um, the, if you look at the world today, um, you know, there's a sense of where do we start with uh, the, the sense of, uh, of conflict and risks of conflict. And I'm not going to be comprehensive. Um, it would be absurd to be comprehensive. Um, what I'm going to focus on is one very disturbing trend, I think of it as a trend, and that is the growing areas of insecure territory, growing areas where you don't have a recognized government in secure control of the territory. And uh, what have we seen recently? Mali, Central African Republic. You know, I, I sort of, the bottom billion was in a way um, modeled around the Central African Republic, which I've just been to when I wrote the book. And I, one of the lines in the bottom billion is, some countries are not just falling behind, they're falling <laughs> apart. Um, and at the time I went, 10, 11 years ago, the Central African Republic was falling behind and now is falling apart. Um, so Mali, Central African Republic, Northeast Nigeria, Somalia, of course, uh, East Ukraine, Libya, um, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, most alarming of all, Pakistan. Um, this is a scary prospect. Um, Leviathan um, is falling apart in parts of the world. And retrospectively, um, Leviathan looks quite attractive. Um, I should say, I've just finished on the plane reading uh, Kitzinger's latest book, World Order, which is uh, a, uh, an exercise in concentrating the mind on, uh, on realism. So I recommend it. Um, it's just come out. Um, so why? Um, uh, is Leviathan falling apart in all these places? And my answer, which is going to be deeply unpalatable, and I'm well aware of that, um, is that nations are only viable if they're underpinned uh, by a sense of nationalism, a sense of national identity. And for various reasons, um, which I want to go through, that sense of nationalism, national identity has been weakened been weakened globally and it's certainly been weakened in these societies. Um, so let me start by saying why do nations need a sense of nationalism? Um, and the, the simplest reason is that they need a sense of nationalism in order to make public services work effectively. Um, and I'm going to introduce a concept of effective organizations. An effective organization is an organization which makes, makes the people who work in it, ordinary people, productive. And um, it does so by reconciling scale with motivation. We know that to make people productive, you've got to have scale. But as you get an organization bigger, 
that creates the problem of how to motivate people. And uh, economists for years have been coming up with the answer in order to motivate people, you, you do it by carrots and sticks, incentives. Um, and the latest thinking in economics recognizes that that's uh, really a very limited approach to motivation. Um, there's a brilliant book by Nobel laureate in economics, George Akerlof, um, called Identity Economics. And what I say will in part be drawing on George's work. It's a very short little book, it's really, really good. Um, why does this matter for the countries in question? Because not only do they not have effective organisations in general, effective public organisations, um, they don't have effective armies. Um, and just, uh, just look at, uh, at what's happened recently. Um, the, the government army in Iraq. Uh, billions of dollars in money, massive amount of equipment, massive effort at training. And it completely falls apart. It doesn't even fight against just a relative handful um, of, uh, of opponents. Um, extraordinary, they, uh, Iraq loses its second city, city of two million people, without a fight, having spent all that effort and money on a national army, which just runs away. Nigeria, Nigeria, billions of dollars again, spent on the Nigerian army. And it's then got what is, to my mind, a piddling task of securing northeast Nigeria against a threat from a sm relatively small number of informally organized opponents. And it can't do it. It's being beaten. And then most uh, spectacularly of all, I think, um, Kenya. Um, you remember the, the awful event of the shopping mall, um, where the army is called in to, um, to just protect ordinary citizens in that shopping mall who are being, who are being murdered by a group of terrorists. And what do the soldiers do? Here they've got an opportunity to defend their fellow citizens against murderous attackers. And they use the opportunity to go on a shopping spree. They loot the shopping mall. Right? Now, these are astounding failures of military organization. Right? Um, and to show how astounding they are, I'm going to do a detour into some social psychology of how motivation works in organizations, in public organizations, and indeed in most private organizations. The only private organizations that have depended exclusively on carrots and sticks is the investment banks. And look where that got them. Um, so the uh, effective organizations work by um, building motivation by getting people to internalize the objectives of the organization. That's the key move, internalizing the object, so the organization's objectives become mine. Um, and that's done, that process of internalization is done through three building blocks, um, identities, narratives, and norms. So um, with an identity um, in a military, it's the, it's, the, it's the step which, where the soldier takes the step, I am a good soldier. That's the move of identity. That's the key point in Akerlof. It's that I am a good whatever. The narrative and militaries have, have a uniquely favorable narrative that they can offer their workforce. And that narrative is your role is to defend the country to protect your fellow citizens. Hugely attractive narrative. Um, 
I got a teenage boy, and like most teenage boys, um, what he really wants to do um, is play video games in which he plays at shooting people, defending people, basically being in an army. Um, so the narrative of I'm, my military prowess is defending other people, hugely attractive especially for the young men that armies need. And then the norms which come out of that, um, norms of self-sacrifice. You know, armies are just, in most developed countries, are astounding in that you take perfectly ordinary young men and they're willing to die for that. That becomes the norm. They're willing to die for the organization. Um, even the investment banks, with their millions of dollars of bonuses, seldom get their workforce to die on their behalf. Right? Um, that set of narratives, identities, and norms is self-reinforcing. It's an equilibrium, and it's delivered through social network. And an army has a very bounded social network, which is easy to control. And so the leadership of an army, or for that matter, the leadership of a country, is in a, it's, it's much easier to build that identity narrative and norm in an army than it is to build it, say, um, in the uh, teaching profession. So the, the military is the easiest part of the public sector to, to get motivated. Um, in a nutshell, an effective organization is a locally stable constellation of identities, narratives, and norms, and networks that makes the workforce productive by reconciling scale with motivation. And the countries that I've listed above um, are desperately short of effective public organizations. Um, it's not just their armies don't work, but the whole of their public sector doesn't work. But as I say, the, the army is the easiest bit to get to work. So if the army isn't working, you know that the rest of the public sector isn't working. You know the teachers won't be showing up for school, the nurses will be stealing drugs, and so on and so forth. Yeah? But at heart, at bottom, this is a problem of a failure to internalize the objectives of the organization. Now, the, um, in order to get that internalization, um, an identity of I'm a member of this, I, I, I belong to the nation, and a narrative of defending the nation is hugely useful and a norm of sacrifice for the nation. And so, lacking that sense of national identity it's very hard to get any of these uh, clusters established that build an effective organization. Um, the, um, if you like, just about, uh, 10 years ago, I suggested the idea of a conflict trap. And in a way, there's a, uh, an ineffective state trap that um, if you start without national identity, your public sector organizations don't work. But then if your public sector organizations don't work, um, it's that much harder for citizens to buy into national identity. There's not much to be proud about. Um, I should say to Priya, in, in order to study this phenomenon, um, the techniques you need are techniques of anthropology combined with experimental social psychology. And it's, it's no surprise that the, I think the two best recent books in conflict studies, um, one is um, Morris' book, War, What's It Good For? He's an anthropologist. Um, and the other is the, the Better Angels of Our Nature um, by Steve Pinker, uh, a social psychologist. Um, so what's gone wrong with building that sense of, of national identity um, in, in these societies. Um, 
The, uh, and my argument is that uh, in the last 20 years or so, um, the, the sense of national identity has been um, superseded um, in, uh, in, so, in some countries by the rise of global ideologies. And by global ideology, I mean a, an ideology which purports to, uh, to have universal applicability. Um, now, it's ironic because 20 years ago, we got rid of one of these damn global ideologies, yeah. um, communism. You know, it, it imploded. Um, uh, and so it looked as if we were liberated at last from these global ideologies. Um, but now I think we've got two um, new ones. And the, the first, the very obvious, is, is radical Islam. Um, uh, and I want to suggest that radical Islam is not due to the West. It's not something that, in any sense, we have produced. I think it's exogenous to, uh, to, to our own behavior. Um, um, and actually, it's a very important psychological mood for people in the West to realize that not everything that happens in the world is due to what we do. Right? Um, there are th there's stuff that happens out there um, which affects us, but which we didn't cause. Right? And radical Islam's one of them. Right? Um, radical Islam, if you decompose it into an identity, a narrative, a norm, delivered through a social network, is hugely attractive to a minority of young men. Hugely. It's, it, it, it's the same sort of appeal as, as, as the National Army, in effect. It has a, a compelling identity that people can uh, adopt, a compelling narrative which explains what, what, how the world works, and a compelling set of norms which makes them feel really good about themselves. Um, and, of course, uh, a ready-made electronic social network that, uh, that, that can be spread. Um, the, what that does is make uh, the military forces that it builds highly effective because they're highly motivated. Um, you just have to think of ISIS versus the Iraq army to, to see that, or Boko Haram uh, versus the Nigerian army. Um, these were basically contests between a highly motivated and an unmotivated organization. And uh, the highly motivated wins despite huge material disadvantages. Um, so that's one global ideology that's just there. We didn't cause it. Um, I'm not even sure we can do that much about it because actually, look, the, the recruits um, fighting for ISIS are drawn from pretty well every Western country, so the, the feasible range of variation in Western policy doesn't really seem to, to affect that, uh, the recruiting very much. Um, so I'm going to be more interested, um, that's just something we have to live with and contend with, um, but I'm going to be more interested in the, the rise of the other global ideology. And this is ours, because it's our ideology. Um, and because it's our ideology, we find it hugely attractive. Um, not just attractive, but compelling. So compelling that that's why we think everybody should adopt it. The problem with global ideologies is that when it's yours, it's hugely seductive to make that move, that because it's so obviously right, um, everybody should buy into it. And if they don't buy into it, we're going to make them buy into it. Um, and that, that, that narrative, of course, is the espousal of democracy and human rights. And I'm not against democracy and human rights. Right? I'm part of that um, uh, uh, ideology, but I've come to balk at uh, saying it's got to be a global ideology. Um, the, um, uh, we do try and impose it as a global ideology. We enforce it by aid. Um, 
we enforce it by arms, uh, and we enforce it by our courts, international courts. So there's, there's not much doubt we